The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Good morning. This is uh, lecture number two of the Operational Reactor Safety course. I'm Professor Andrew Kadak, as you probably already know by now. And today we're going to talk about uh, a review of reactor physics. Now, once again, as I want to repeat, uh, we're assuming that you've taken fundamental reactor physics course and that what we're going to talk about here very fast in essentially one lecture is a review so that we're all rough, roughly on the same page as we go forward in, the, uh, in this course. Now, what we're going to cover in this lecture are some basics such as cross-sections, the, the fundamentals of the fission process. We're going to look at both infinite reactor systems and finite reactor systems to identify the differences, certainly in analysis. We're going to look at the four-factor formula and the six-factor formula, which is the formula for criticality. We're going to assess how we do control criticality in terms of control rods and other uh, neutron absorbers. We'll begin and introduce you and remind you about diffusion theory, and we'll conclude with the neutron transport equation, which we formally have called the Boltzmann equation. So it's going to be quite a lot of material. It's going to go relatively fast. But having taken the course, you should be fine with it. Now, first of all, we're going to talk about the fundamentals of the uh, neutron capture and what happens in the neutron capture of uranium-235 atom. So having been struck by a neutron, you have essentially an unstable uranium-236 nuclei, which can, can have certain things occur. And each one of these things occurs with a certain probability. And the probabilities are essentially expressed in terms of cross-sections, or barns. Now, you can have an elastic scattering collision where the neutron, in fact, just essentially bounces off the uranium-235 atom and, and just continues on as possibly slowed down, just ever so slightly. You can have inelastic scattering when you, when you can create a neutron that's slightly captured and then essentially in, initially emitted. You can capture a, a neutron and create uranium-236 with the release of some gamma energy. Or you can have multiple neutron emissions and captures where you can emit two neutrons, resulting in uranium-234. Or lastly, and the thing that we're most interested in, is the fission process. And in the fissioning, these are the things that, that we have to understand that might occur in the uranium atom when a neutron is, is in fact, when a neutron strikes uranium-235. Now, the concept of cross-sections is, is a very important concept in nuclear reactor physics. You have what we call a total cross-section, which is the total probabilities of either scattering or absorption. These are the two phenomena that we're talking about. And if you scatter, you can have an elastic scattering cross-section or an inelastic scattering cross-section, which are combined to the fundamental scattering cross-section. Or you can have an absorption going on where you can just capture it, and you can have all of these functions that occur, where you have various, you have radiative capture we talked about, we talked about charged particle neutron and multiple neutron emissions. And each one of these has a certain probability of occurrence, which is expressed in its own cross-section. And then, of course, as part of the absorption, we have a fission cross-section, which, as I said earlier, is, which is what we want to focus on so that we can make some power and some heat. Now, this chart gives you a summary of some of the critical thermal neutron cross-sections of important fissile and fertile nuclides. And let me just point out first the uranium-235. And you can see the absorption cross-section is quite high. And the capture cross-section is, is, is somewhat lower. But the fission cross-section is, is, in fact, very, very high. For a thermal neutron, this is a good attribute to have. And you can see these number of neutrons produced per fission, the mu's and the eta's which are also very key parameters, because the, the higher these numbers are, the more neutrons are produced per fission. We can then look at uranium-238, which has a relatively low absorption in the thermal energy range. 
and essentially has no fission cross-section, which is why we call uranium-238 a fertile, uh, fertile atom. We can then drop down and look at plutonium-239 in the thermal energy range, which has a very high uh, absorption cross-section and a very, very high fission cross-section, which makes plutonium a good fuel for thermal reactors. And in fact, if you look at the depletion and the creation of plutonium from uranium-238, roughly 30% or so of the power near the end of life of a fuel assembly comes from plutonium, because it does have a very high fission cross-section. And it also has a high neutron production rate per fission. You can see plutonium-241 also has similar characteristics. And the odd isotope numbers in the plutonium uh, array of nuclides are fissionable, and the even numbers are pretty much absorbers. Now, when you look at uranium cross-section as a function of energy, and that's this neutron energy from EVs to MEV levels, and you can see at very high energies, uranium-238 does have a fission cross-section, which in some ways can be used in fast reactors. Now, for us to be effective as, as, as a thermal reactor, which we're in the 0.025 EV range, we need to take a neutron that may be born at MEV levels, MEV uh, energies, and we need to slow it down so that when we get into the thermal energy range, it has a high enough cross-section so that we can count on a, on a very relatively high fission rate to support nuclear reactions. Now what you see in the middle here is a, is a resonance absorption region where neutrons, as they're slowing down through this region of say a one to looks like a thousand EV, you'll have probabilities of fission occurring, but neutrons are scattering through this range and ultimately ending up in the thermal spectrum. Now the chain reaction process is relatively straightforward and what we're trying to do is create essentially at least 2.5 neutrons so that these 2.5 neutrons, 1.5 of which could be absorbed by what we call non-fissioning nuclei or in fact escape from the reactor. We need at least one neutron to survive this non a non-fissile absorption to create our next fission, which then produces 2.5 neutrons, which goes on and on and on. And we've used a relatively simplistic term called neutron multiplication factor, which is the K, that if the K equals one, the neutron population is steady, as is the fission rate. If it's greater than one, namely we produce more neutrons in one generation compared to the next, neutron population grows as does the fission, as does the fission rate. This supercritical condition is not necessarily a desirable condition for a thermal commercial nuclear power plant. If the, if the K is less than one, the reactor is sub subcritical, when in fact neutron population will ultimately decrease and the uh, fission rate will decrease, essentially shutting down your reactor. So the target for thermal reactors and reactors in general is to make sure that the neutron population and fission rate, the absorption and loss rate, is, is balanced, and namely the K is in fact one. Now, this, this slide is an interesting slide because it, is it, it, it shows you what happens when a neutron is, is born as a result of the fission. This is called the fission neutron energy spectrum based on the fissioning thermal fissioning of uranium-235. You can see that this is a distribution function of energies. You can see most of the neutrons are born within one and two MeV. Some are much higher in terms of even up to eight. But you use this function to determine what is the estimated energy of the neutrons coming out that will affect your ability to calculate the likelihood of the next fission. Again, the target is to, is to take all these energies and slow the neutrons down to the thermal spectrum so that it can be an efficient fission producer. Now, what we are worried about in, 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 in nuclear, commercial nuclear power, is our ability to, to harness the energy of a fission. 
And this chart explains where that energy comes from. When you split a, uh, a uranium-235 atom, you will create what we call fission fragments. As you understand that when an atom is split, it creates essentially two parts, and these two parts carry off a certain amount of energy. And, and, and the energy is relatively large, 168 MeV per fission. And you'll see, quickly go, dropping down to the bottom, that the amount of energy per fission is around 200 MeV. So what we want to do is be able to harness this energy in a way that we can produce heat to heat the water and then we'll ultimately make steam. So we have some energy that's taken off in the neutrons, some prompt, prompt, prompt gamma, gamma rays, and some beta energies and also some delayed gammas. But by and large, the energy that is produced that is capturable as a heat is about 200 MeV, most of which is in the heat of fission products slowing down. So this, ch this chart gives us a sense of how we're going to be able to use a fission to create heat to capture ultimately in the, uh, in the water, which is the cooler. Now this, this chart is an also, also an interesting chart that basically graphically illustrates, symbolically at least, what occurs. A neutron striking the uranium-235 atom, releasing some gammas, some neutrons, creating two fission fragments, which themselves have a distribution of occurrence. And these fission fragments, in this example here, we produce, uh, it looks like uh, brom bromine, which then subsequently decays in 1.6 seconds to krypton, which decays to another element, strontium, and I can't quite make that out, and ultimately ends up as a stable zirconium. And the, and the time half-lives of these range from 3, 32 seconds to 27 minutes, looks like 29 years and 64 hours. So you can see as a result of a fission, we're producing fission fragments that also subsequently release energy. And down on, on, on this fission fragment, it starts with xenon and ends with neodymium, I believe, which is the, which is the last uh, fission fragment. And the time uh, half-lives are uh, one second, roughly 12 seconds, minutes, hours, and days. So you can see we need to keep track, even as a result of the fission, how all these things uh, occur and how long they take, because every one of these has the possibility of either an absorption, a capture, or a scattering, which we need to understand if we're going to try to figure out do we have sufficient neutrons to go critical. Now this is the uh, an interesting chart on the fission fission yield by mass number. In other words, if a fission occurs, the uranium-235 nucleus will split up in roughly this saddle-type distribution where the likelihood is really having a, an element with a mass number in the 90s or perhaps an element with a mass number of, say, 140. But there is a distribution with a certain likelihood. This, too, needs to be factored into our core physics analysis. In order to better understand how, how um, these uh, possibilities arise, there's, there's this chart of the nuclei, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. These are very important charts which depict every known isotope and its uh, natural abundance, its radiation types and energies, its thermal cross-section in barns, which is a measure of, of uh, this, the size of the of likelihood of the capture, and various half-lives in terms of fission cross-sections and uh, of the various yield products. So if you look at this and you study this, you'll be able to completely appreciate what the likelihood of a uranium-235 fission cross-section is, capture cross-section, and if it simply is a uh, basic capture, it might in fact go to uranium-236 with a certain cross-section and then ultimately decay into some other things. So you can in fact follow the course of the decay by understanding how these chart of the nucleides in fact works. This is very important to appreciate and understand. Now this is a typical example of a series, and I'm going to focus not on the thorium series, 
but on the uranium-238 series, where if a uranium-238, well, let me just start where, where we need to be. If we take uranium-238, now this is sort of the uh, plutonium production sequence, but this chart explains this direction is efficient, this direction is a beta decay on this chart of nuclides, the various cross-sections and half-lives, and the types of reaction that you can get. If you follow uranium-238, it, it, it can capture a neutron and go into uranium-239, and then with 23-minute half-life, half it can go to neptunium-239, which then, in 2.3 days, goes to plutonium-239, which is the fish, fissile isotope of interest, which, of course, then can fission and split up into the two fission fragments. It can also, with a half-life of, looks like, 271 days, duplicate to plutonium-240, and then 241, then americium. So what we're trying to do is be able to appreciate all the possibilities that result from either a capture, neutron capture in a fertile isotope, and then how it can become fissile by its decay and or other neutron absorptions. And these, the, like you can see here, there's a fission in 238, there's a fission in 241, and there's a fission in 243. All this information is very important in understanding how these reactors actually function and whether or not we can predict criticality. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but in the fertile to fissile chain, you look at uranium-238, captures the neutron-239, by beta decay goes to neptunium, neptunium to plutonium-239. And this is, again is the fissile isotope. This is a simpler diagram than the one I just showed you, but the principles are the same. A lot of people talk about the thorium fuel cycle. Thorium-232 capturing a neutron goes to thorium-233 which ultimately decays to uranium-233 which is again a fissile isotope that can be used to power nuclear power plants based on a thorium fuel cycle, not a uranium fuel cycle. So what is it that we're ultimately trying to do in, uh, in nuclear power? We want to make and capture the heat from the fission process and in order to do that, we've got to design a core. And the core has to be able to uh, contain a sufficient amount of uranium in a certain configuration that will not leak out neutrons and sustain itself for a 12 to 24 month period such that we can harness the energy without refueling more often than 12 to 24 months. So what we need to consider is what we in fact put into the core in terms of the fuel. We need to configure, we need to understand what kinds of other materials need to go in the fuel, such as the cladding, the internal structures, that could be absorbers that would take away neutrons. We have to decide on how long a life of the reactor core we want. And by lifetime, we mean the time from when we start up the reactor till the time that we need to refuel it. That obviously affects the amount of fuel you put in and the fundamentals of the internals of the design. This reactivity swing is a measure of, from the initial enrichment, which is, will have to be over-enriched in uranium, to a point when all the uranium that is used up, making the reactor subcritical. That's the ultimate reactivity swing during operation. And we also have to consider certain refueling strategies. And what this basically means is do we want to take the entire core out and replace it with a fresh core? Or do we want to take a third of the core out or a quarter of the core out? And that refueling strategy is largely dictated by economics and refueling interval. So what we're going to now explore is how do we in fact make the power and how do we understand how to calculate that. So we mentioned earlier one of the important things for us to do is take neutrons that are born fast, slow them down, and then have them thermalized so that they can be used as a neutron population to create fissions. So essentially all the neutrons are born fast from a fission and we need to have them slow down through this resonance region by multiple scatterings with moderator, the moderator being the material that we put into the core 
which typically in a light water reactor is water, that we want to have the neutron scatter, and by scattering it's hopefully elastic scattering, to have the neutron slow down to a point and not be absorbed, such that they end up in the thermal regime, which can be used to, uh, to make the power. This is the challenge. Now, as you recall from the uranium-238 slide, and I think the next slide will show it, now this is a function of cross-section as a function of energy on a log plot. You have the fast region, and then you have a resonance region, and this is the standard plot. And near the thermal energy range, we have this 1 over B region, which, which is a typical description of how the cross-section will increase with uh, the velocity, or actually, de will decrease, will, the cross-section will increase as the velocity, in fact, decreases. So what we're trying to do is find a way that we can get neutrons in this region not to be captured in the residence, and then survive to this region. And this is the challenge of reactor design. Now, when we think about a moderator, which is that material, water, or perhaps graphite that we put in a reactor, we want to be able to select a moderator that has obviously a low capture cross-section and a high potential for elastic scattering in terms of reducing the energy of the neutron more. So the fewer collisions the, to reduce the, the neutron energy to thermal energies, the better you are. And that's the less likely that that particular neutron will be captured. So here are some uh, nuclides of interest. Uh, hydrogen, deuterium, carbon, sodium, and obviously uranium. And you can see that the change in energy as a result of a collision is, is really strongly determined by the mass. You can see the amount of energy change over the certain energy. Uranium-238 is not a particularly good moderator. However, deuterium is a very good moderator, as, as is hydrogen. So what we're trying to do, and sodium, just for the record, is not a very good moderator, and we use sodium for fast reactors. So that we're trying to understand the number of collisions required to thermalize a neutron. And water is quite good. Deuterium is also quite good. Carbon is all right. Clearly, the heavier the atom, the less effective it is, because it's sort of like a billiard ball collision with a heavier atom. So typical moderators in reactors, thermal reactors, are deuterium and hydrogen. Graphite can also be used. And these lethargies are, are basically the amount of energy lost per collision. So this is the reason why water is, in fact, chosen. Fewer number of collisions to allow for effective slowing down, which reduces the likelihood of capture. Now, when we think about trying to calculate the um, criticality of a reactor, there are infinite systems, which means the, the structure is, is, or the design of the core is infinite, uh, which does not take into account leakage. And there's a simple four-factor formula that we, that we use to essentially compare infinite systems or infinite core cores. We also have fi finite systems which consider leakage and, and various leakage opportunities for fast neutrons and thermal neutrons. And the way we capture all of this is, is through what we now call diffusion theory, which is a simplified notion of how the rate of production, rate of capture, and absorption, and loss, and leakage is handled. So let me just now talk a bit about these infinite systems. And in an infinite system, and we're going to calculate the four-factor formula, which you're, I'm sure, quite familiar with. But an infinite system essentially is, is one in which there is no, no leakage and the fuel is infinitely distributed, which obviously is not realistic. What I'd like to do now is talk about an infinite system. And an infinite system is basically a system that has the core that's infinitely uh, dispersed, which is obviously not realistic. But the key here is no leakage. And we can characterize the, the, uh, the K 
which we call the k infinite by a number of terms. Now, the first thing that happens, as you recall, is that a fission is produced. And we define a number of terms. Let me define this epsilon as the fast fission factor. Now, we haven't gotten to these definitions, but it's total fissions which are the fast plus the thermal divided by the thermal fissions. Recalling that we could have also fast fissions. The next term that we use is the resonance, that's a P, resonance escape probability and that's a measure of once a neutron is born what's the probability that neutron survives and ends up in the thermal regime and that is measured as a macroscopic cross section of uh, absorption thermal divided by the integral of all energies in terms of absorptions. And the absorption cross-section, as you know, is a function of the capture cross-section plus the fission cross-section. And cross-sections also, as uh, you are aware, are the number density times the microscopic cross-section. And whether it be a absorption, or a fission, or a scattering, the same terms apply. So we have a resonance escape probability, which is measured in this term. Then we have the mu, which is the number of neutrons Produce per fission. And then we have an eta, which is the average number of fission neutrons produced per thermal neutron absorbed in fissionable material. So when you combine all of these factors, you get the familiar, or oh, I, I neglected to mention, the thermal utilization factor here, which is the fourth term, and I'll just put that up here, which is the F, which is the thermal utilization factor, and that is measured by the macroscopic fission cross-section divided by the macroscopic absorption cross-section over all energies. And this is the most important, or one of the most important criteria, which is basically it measures the fraction of the total neutrons absorbed uh, in fissionable nuclides. And that gives you this, this term here. So when you write the four-factor formula, you end up with the probability it escapes fission times the thermal utilization factor times the eta times the epsilon. And that assumes, obviously, no leakage. And this is a rough parameter that one uses to see and judge comparative core designs and core systems. But that's not really that 
in, uh, helpful for actually reacting these on. The, the most important one is for finite systems, we have a K effective, which does consider leakage. Now, K effective can be defined relatively straightforwardly by production of, new, of neutrons divided by losses. So if you have a certain number of neutrons produced and, you, and that equals the production and that equals the number of losses, your K effective would be 1, which is the desirable function. Now, if you think about K effective, you will have a production term, which we can get to, and the losses are not only by absorption, but also by leakage. And this is, is the important phenomenon to understand. And if you rewrite this equation, you will be able to get a term that can be written this way, which is leakage over absorption. And this is this term here is sometimes called excess multiplication. Okay. Important concept. What I'd like to now do is go to the next slide. Now, if we look at this neutron life cycle again with a more sophisticated analysis, which um, addresses leakage at high, uh, high energies and at low energies, this chart sort of results, but the same phenomenon occurs. And without spending a lot of time on each one of these uh, letters and, and what they represent, I'd like to focus more on the concept, and that is what actually is going on in this, in this core, and how does one explain it? So if we start up here, fast neutrons produced by fission, uh, by thermal fission, and then you add the total number of fast neutrons produced, these neutrons can in fact leak and then you can count the number of neutrons leaking that are fast. And then you look at some of the neutrons that are captured in uranium-238 through a resonance escape probability, ultimately ending up with a group of thermalized neutrons that also have a certain probability of leakage from the reactor. And, and if you as, you keep these neutrons from escaping the leakage, they then become available to become absorbed in uranium-238. So this identifies a number of thermal neutrons absorbed in control rods and in water. Now that's sort of the thermal utilization. So you have neutrons actually getting into the thermal energy range, and then these neutrons become absorbed, not capable of producing fission. But then you have some neutrons that do end up being absorbed in the fuel, uranium-235. And then there's certain likelihood that some of these neutrons absorbed in the fuel do not fission. But ultimately, you get thermal neutrons which are captured in the fuel, which cause a fission producing neutrons, and hopefully at least 2.5. So if you understand this chart, you will begin to appreciate the life of a neutron in, in a reactor core. 
And all these things need to be analyzed and understood in a reactor physics calculation. So when you look at some of these expressions now, and this is now the six-factor formula, which is the symbol, we still use the same symbol K, and without going through all these terms because they are sometimes tedious, but the functions you've just seen described above. It captures the life cycle at various stages such that the production over losses is equal to approximately one. And this term, which is the six-factor formula, captures absorbed leakage over fission which are produced. And another way of expressing it is how many neutrons are in this generation as compared to the preceding generation, which is, uh, if you maintain that to be a constant number, when it's unity, the reactor is critical. When it's less than that, the reactor will, in fact, shut down. And again, here are the definitions uh, that were used in the previous expression. Uh, don't want to go over these at this point, but you can read them at your leisure. But these are the important concepts which we've just gone through. Uh, more definitions. And um, what this term basically is, 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 a, is an important one relative to having neutrons that are actually capable of producing the fission. In terms of uh, neutron loss mechanisms, which, are, which can be significant, these are some parameters that one could compare. Remember, a neutron has a certain lifetime, from the time it's born to the time it's either gets captured. And you can measure that in distance as well. So if your reactor is on the scale of meters, the neutron length scale is on the end, uh, in terms of, it looks like a thermal neutron is on the order of a tenth of a meter. And as the, essentially, this scale, this grows, like the, if the L go, gets smaller, the probability of escape grows, which is obvious. And also, we have capture by reactor materials. And these materials uh, are in the form of control rods, which are used to control the reaction rate, burnable poisons, which are used in some reactors to control excess reactivity, and obviously structural materials such as iron, steel, uh, zirconium from the fuel. And the moderator also has an absorption cross-section that, in fact, can be used not only to uh, slow down neutrons, but as a neutron absorber. So what we have here, and, and perhaps sometimes the coolant is different than the moderator in uh, several designs, such as the MIT reactor, or a high-temperature gas cooled reactor, where helium is the coolant, the moderator being graphite. So with appreciation of the kinds of things that can take neutrons away from the system, you then are in a position to uh, design a core. Now, the question for the reactor designer at first is, how long should K be one before you need to, to refuel? And the choices typically people are now making used to be a 12 year, 12 month annual cycle, where the reactor be shut down, refueled, and operated for 12 months. Right now, reactor designers are going to much longer time periods these being 18 to 24 months. And the way to do that, as, as you all realize, is once a neutron gets absorbed in the uranium atom, it fissions and is no longer capable of producing a fission. So that you have to load the reactor with excess reactivity to cover the 18 months or 24 months that the reactor might in fact be operating. So you put in more fuel, more uranium-235, higher enrichment, and you need to balance that excess reactivity in a number of ways. The way one does it is for, for BWRs, they use two things. They use a burnable poison, which is a poison, a neutron absorber that you put into the core with the fuel such that when a neutron is born, it hits it rather than the fuel and creates a longer life fuel because the burnable poisons that sort of capture excess neutrons without fissioning the fuel. Or you can do it as in a PWR where they put in what we call soluble boron, which is, what is boric acid, essentially, put into the coolant that will be used to, and gradually reduced in concentration as the reactor operates, it acts as a uniform neutron 
that is, in fact, the burnable poison. And over time, at the end of the operating life, the boron concentration is essentially at zero, and the reactor slowly begins to shut itself down unless you decide to refuel. You can also control excess reactivity by leakage. The re reactor can, can be designed in such a way that it has a high leakage core. And sometimes that's useful for uh, reactor design and safety. Some reactors allow for online refueling. In other words, they don't require all this excess reactivity in the fuel. And in the CANDU reactor, which is the uh, Canadian, uh, essentially a natural, natural uranium reactor, where they use deuterium as a moderator uh, and water as a coolant, where they are able to take the fuel assemblies out during operation and load fresh fuel assemblies. It's a calandria type reactor. Or you could have a pebble bed reactor, which is a continuously uh, flowing, not flowing, but it was a rope, okay, let's call it a continuous flowing of pebbles that go in and out of the reactor over time to make up the excess reactivity. So once the pebble is depleted, it can be put, a fresh pebble can be put in, or it can be recirculated back in the reactor if this burn up isn't, isn't, uh, isn't all uh, used up, or the fuel isn't all used up. Let me now touch a little bit on, on diffusion theory, because this is, this is sort of the, the way people normally uh, do reactor analysis. And diffusion theory has as its basis uh, some fundamentals that we'll, we'll just quickly go over here. Okay, now we're going to talk about uh, diffusion theory. And this is how we, in fact, keep track of neutrons in terms of production and destruction and leakage. And it's essentially a neutron balance for a critical reactor. And it does consider all of these phenomena. And you, have, you can do it in one group theory or multi-group theory. Now one group theory assumes that the neutron energy and everything's going on at one energy. That one energy is to be crushed for our selection in the thermal reactor, the thermal energies. And we have to make some adjustments. And multi-group allows for a little more sophisticated treatment. We take the, say, the two MeV down to essentially a thermal energy range, and we decide what energy levels and what, how many groups do we need to properly characterize the slowing down, the absorptions at various energy levels. And as you can recall, we had the high energy level where there was a, the fissions occurring, we had a residence region, and then we had a thermal region. Most people do analysis, likely the number of groups could be like 30 or so, to properly capture what might be going on in a reactor. But many analyses are quite fine with four group energies. But let me start now with the fundamentals of diffusion theory, and I'm going to go, going to, go to the board here for a moment and um, lay out what, what, why people call it diffusion theory and what actually it means. Okay, now we're going to talk about one, one group diffusion theory. And we're going to explain a bit about how, why we call it diffusion theory. Now typically a neutron is born and it has many possibilities. And, and, and the possibilities are it has a certain energy level, as we saw in the, in the, 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 the spectrum of energies produced as a function of fission. It is going in a certain direction, which is sort of the omega. And this energy can be characterized as a velocity, which means it's going at a certain speed. And it's located at a certain point. And it's created at a certain time. And, and its prob probability of interacting with something else within a certain distance we call that a cross-section, which is the microscopic cross-section, which, is a, as we mentioned before, is a, it could be absorption, capture, fission, scatter. So a neutron is challenged, if you will, because once it's born, 
we're not exactly sure which way it's going to go. We kind of know where it is because that where it's born because that's where the uranium has to be. We can more or less guess at the time and how long it might survive before it's either captured, scattered, or absorbed. But all this stuff, these, these cross sections are, are measured as a function of energy. They're measured as a, as, as a function of, of uh, actually the, the neutron energy, and the, which is a function of the temperature of the particular medium. So with this basic information, we're going to try to collapse it down to something that assumes it's one speed, essentially going in a direction. Maybe it's a universal direction. But we're not going to be all that sensitive to it in, in diffusion theory. But we are going to be sensitive to its location and the material that the neutron will see during its uh, lifetime. So when, when we try to write this expression, we look at, if you will, a term that we just like to describe, perhaps not appropriately, but it's called neutron leakage uh, uh, for travel through a medium. A medium. And, and, and what that basically means is if a neutron is born here, it's going to go from here to here, leaking out of a certain confined space. And the way we do that is we establish and we use what we call Fick's law, law of diffusion which is a simplification of all of the phenomena that this poor neutron is going to have to see as it tries to go from point A to point B. And we define this, if you will, current or neutron current as a term which has a diffusion coefficient as a function of the gradient of the flux of neutrons at that position R. So this D represents a mixture of absorption, scattering, materials. And this D allows one to say, all right, in this area here, the neutron is going to be exposed to certain hazards, if you will. And if it survives those hazards and comes out the other side, uh, we can arguably say that the phenomenon that that neutron has gone through is called diffusion. And that's why this fixed law of diffusion applies. And the gradient of the flux, and the flux, recall, is the number of neutrons going at a certain velocity at location R. And it's the gradient is, is, is the determining factor in terms of how many neutrons actually end up surviving this path. So if you were to write the leakage expression by itself, which is the gradient of the current, it ends up being minus d double gradient of R. So if we take this term as the leakage term, we then can, can essentially identify for certain geometries, and let's just say the slab geometry, where you have a slab where a neutron will be coming, say, this way and coming out this way we will be able to identify that, the, and this is the x dimension, j of x is equal to minus d, the gradient of the flux, or the first derivative of the flux. Then the leakage would be second derivative of the Blocks. So having, having defined these fundamentals, 
we can then describe what a neutron and balance equation might look like. So, if we write the fundamental equation down, production for a neutron balance. Now, this is a neutron balance equation. We have production equals absorption plus leakage. Now, the production term is relatively straightforward. Number of neutrons produced per fission times the macroscopic fission cross-section times the flux. Or if you like. In one group. The absorption term also is relatively straightforward. Macroscopic absorption cross section times the uh, flux. And the leakage term, which we've just written down, is this term. So if you understand that the macroscopic cross-section, say for fission, is the number of uranium-235 atoms times the, the cross-section for fission for U-235, you have defined this term quite well. This term is, a, is the macroscopic absorption cross-section of all the materials in the reactor, and this is the leakage term that would suggest that depending upon the gradient of the flux, you'll have a certain amount of leakage, and this diffusion coefficient we'll define in a few moments. If you rewrite this expression in terms of, let's just say, uh, move this over to one side, you will have the following expression. The, gra the gradient of the flux oops, plus nu sigma f minus sigma a divided by d equals zero. So we moved things from this side over to this side, I just sort of flip the zero on. This term here is called the material buckling. And you can see why. Because it is completely driven by the materials in the core in terms of the cross-sections and the number densities of the various materials. So rewriting this expression and somewhat simplifying it, you have the gradient of the flux plus Bm squared of the flux equals zero. That's the neutron balance equation if you want to represent it in terms of material, in terms of the materials. Now to solve this expression for a, what we call it a bare critical system, this expression also has a mathematical solution with a certain boundary condition where we can just assume for the sake of argument that the flux equals zero at boundary of the system. Okay? And if you do that, 
you will basic, basically be able to go to the next slide here, which gives you some standard solutions for typical shapes. So when we try to solve that neutron balance equation expressed in this gradient form, and we assume that the reactor is a sphere of radius r, the normalized flux, the phi sub r over the, the flux at the center, can be expressed in this term. And there's a term that's introduced here called the geometric buckling, which is analogous to the material buckling that we define there. And that material, the geometric buckling, has a pi over r squared solution. If you go to a finite cylinder, which means it has uh, top and bottom, the radius r height centered about z equals zero and plus h you know, goes up and down by half, it has a Bessel function solution. And I would refer you to the text on solving these equations for this particular geometry to develop this Bessel function. And also it has a geometric buckling. If you go to an infinite cylinder, it's a, it's a, a simpler Bessel function. And if you go to an infinite slab, it has a cosine type shape. Uh, but one of the things that is very interesting about the mathematical solution, which this is, compared to the uh, sort of the material solution as expressed by the material buckling is for a critical reactor, the material buckling must equal the geometric buckling. And this is, this is how the two are in fact linked. So for a critical system, for a critical system, Bm squared must equal Bg squared for whatever configuration that we're talking about. Which can be very useful in solving some of these equations. So if you then look at how are we going to manipulate these equations to calculate uh, K effective, let me take the next step. So if you then take and, and work with some of these equations and you rewrite them in the sense of k equaling 1, which equals production divided by absorption plus leakage, using these equations, what we can get is the following expression, nu sigma f phi of r, sigma a, phi of r, same expression, minus d, gradient phi of r over phi. And what happens is that these cancel out. And what we have essentially is a k infinity now. And we then manipulate it to a point where 1 equals nu sigma f over sigma a plus d b squared because this expression here can be reduced to a b squared. And if you divide this expression by sigma a, in other words, let's divide by, by sigma a, 
we get the following expression. K infinity equals d b squared plus 1 divided by sigma a. And here again, this is the excess multiplication, and k infinity is defined as nu sigma f over sigma a, which you can recognize from before, which does not have the leakage term. So as we as we then look further in, in this in this analysis, we can we can identify certain critical parameters that we can use to identify whether the system is going to be critical or not. And the most important part of this is going to be the geometric buckling has to be equal to the uh, material buckling. Now there are lots of other approximations that we can go through, but I just don't want to do that at this point in time. But where we want to end up is, you know, if we want to go to a multi-group calculation, the question, as I mentioned earlier, is how do we decide which of these groups and how do we want to break up these groups in terms of number of groups to be able to accurately model. And this is pretty subjective. And it's largely dependent upon the degree of change that's going on in any one of these groups to make some certain judgments. When you think about some of these flux shapes, and this chart basically shows what they might be, you can see the normalized flux versus the normalized distance, that the shapes are basically cosine regardless of whether it's uh, an infinite slab or an infinite cylinder, the fundamental shape is the same and it does have some minor variations. But each one will create a different criticality solution. Okay, let's stop right there. Okay, having, having described that, now let's, let's take a quick look at what the difference between a one-group analysis shows in a multi-group. This would be a two-group analysis. We have a fast and a, a thermal and a fast spectrum. In a one-group analysis, you'll see, if you have a reflector, you will see that the core flux will gradually decrease. And the reflector, of course, is used to uh, prevent leakage and hopefully provide some additional neutrons to head back into the reactor. But it basically uh, allows one to have uh, essentially a uniform power distribution in the core and conserves and reduces the amount of leakage. If you look at the fast and thermal spectrum, you can see that the fast spectrum behaves quite differently than the thermal spectrum. In the fast spectrum, the neutrons mean free path is much larger, and the and the, the flux distribution of fast neutrons is very similar to that of the the thermal neutrons in a single group, but much higher in terms of numbers. Because not all of the fast neutrons will end up being thermalized because of capture. So what we see happening in terms of the fission area is that the number of neutrons is much lower, and that you'll see that in the reflector there's a peak in the uh, neutron thermal spectrum because the fast neutrons are slowing down in this area. So it becomes very important to, when you're designing or, or modeling a, 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 a reactor, is understanding the nature of what's outside the core and whether or not fluxes will peak in that zone. You can see the flux could be as high as that in the center of the core in this model. And also, it does. there is a big difference between the fast and the thermal spectrum, and you have to be very cognizant of that. Now, what we're going to talk about here just very briefly is, is some things that this is sort of a review where you can do analysis beyond diffusion theory that we call Monte Carlo analysis and basically what it does is it tracks a neutron of pick your energy pick your velocity pick your direction 
pick your location, and it will track that neutron as a function of its path length. And will, in the mix of the reactor design, it will determine whether that neutron will leak out, whether it will collide, whether it will capture, and in what energy it will go, and, and what, what energy will it scatter, and what uh, direction it will go, and ultimately that will be able to be leaked again or collided again. And if it's captured, it's basically out of the system. If it leaks, it's also out of the system. Or it can have a collision that can create a fission neutron, which then is tracked as well as the start of a fission, which may be in a quite different place. So this Monte Carlo technique is essentially another way of doing not a diffusion theory calculation, but more of a transport theory calculation, where if you start your number of neutrons and you end up after a certain number of tracking of a certain number of neutrons, that number is equal to the same number you started with, you have, quote unquote, a critical system. So this is another mechanism whereby people can do more detailed analysis than diffusion. Let me now tr try and introduce the Boltzmann equation because it, it basically gives us a, a much deeper appreciation than, than the fusion theory can in terms of what's going on. And it will also provide you with an understanding of how one might break down the multi-group problem into uh, something that's understandable from a mathematical standpoint. So in, new, in neutron transport, we have to know certain things. We need to know the position of the neutron, sort of like in the in the uh, in in the, um, the MCNP or, or Monte Carlo method. We need to know its velocity of the neutron which we can talk about energy. And we need to know the time. In other words, when did this take place? And the velocity obviously has a certain direction. And we can correlate that to a certain energy. And as things occur, we will have location, energy, uh, location, direction, and energy as criteria. And the flux in the Boltzmann equation is represented, and I will not repeat it every time, it's location, energy, direction, and time. So without having to repeat all those parameters, just assume when I write down flux, it, is, it, is, it represents these variables. Now, in the Boltzmann equation, we want to track neutrons. So we need to take the flux and divide it by the velocity. I'm going to write it once. So if we want to know the change, the rate of change of neutrons as a function of time, we will write this expression. If the rate of change of neutrons is 0, so be it. But the rate of neutron change is a function of the same things we talked about before. Leakage. The neutron is going in a certain direction, omega. There's a certain leakage term that we're not going to repeat here, which we'll call leakage. There's also a mechanism whereby there's a macroscopic cross-section for removal of neutrons. This is the total absorption and scattering cross-section. Why, why are we worried about total absorption and scattering? Because once a neutron is scattered, it loses the E that we're trying to track. Obviously, once it's absorbed, it's done. So I'll, I'm afraid I'm going to have to repeat all these omegas. But I won't do it for the fox. The one thing it doesn't have is a T here, which is good. So what this is, what this term basically represents, 
is the interaction or removal of neutrons due to absorption or scatter that would be going at location R going in direction omega. We also produce neutrons. Leakage and removal. We're also producing neutrons. We have a yield rate of neutrons. If a neutron a fission occurs at energy E, this is a spectrum of neutrons uh, energies that are produced. So we're looking only for the neutrons at energy E from the spectrum. And we integrate over DE prime and omega prime. Now, because we're only interested in those neutrons that, that end up with this energy going in our direction. So we put the same production term here. This is a fission. R E prime now omega prime times the flux with all the primes. And it also has a function of T here. So what this term is the production, and, and we don't care where it comes from as long as it ends up at point R, of neutrons from energy E prime, whatever that is, and that's the whole sweep, because we're integrating with overall energy, that end up with this energy. 2E. Then we also have another interesting term that if we integrate over all E prime and all omega prime, that there's a scattering term where a neutron at, at location R is scattered from energy E prime to E and from omega prime to omega with the flux of R E prime omega prime T. So what this term represents is the scattering into E from all energies and all directions omega prime. So if you look at the Boltzmann equation, which is what has been just written, is that it shows you that if the neutron population at point R with E prime going, going in omega at time T, this is neutrons, you have a leakage term straight away, you have a removal based on total uh, removal, including capture and, and scattering of neutrons from this energy and direction. We produce it from all energies that end up within this energy band. We don't care where or how, but we definitely know it's at location R. And we also have it as a, uh, essentially, a scattering into our energy band at location R and going in direction omega. So this is the fundamental equation that we can write uh, that describes how neutrons, in fact, do uh, accumulate. Now, if we wanted to do this, we could write this in, in a number of groups rather than generic. And we can collapse groups by using what we call either an energy weighting system or um, but typically it's done by energy weighting because, for example, if you want to collapse and create a group, what you would do, if, say, if you wanted a cross-section, you would be able to take the macroscopic cross-section at a certain location over a certain energy range, and that would be the average cross-section, you do the integral over that energy level of the particular cross-section, 
let's just call it uh, absorption, times the flux over that region, divided by the integral over the, all the all the energy over that over that same range. So this takes the the cross section as a function of weighted averages over the flux to give you the cross sections you would use for multigroup set. And that's basically how you would do the multigroup analysis. But the Boltzmann equation is a very powerful equation, not because you're going to be running analysis using it, but because it gives you a way to think about what's going on in the reactor as a function uh, from the perspective of the neutron and the things that can occur to it and how it might end up in a particular energy group, which you then can do a multi-group either diffusion equation or solving these types of equations in more, more rigorously. Now, what, what I'd like to sort of wrap up with is what does all this mean to a nuclear engineer? It's obviously very important to be able to understand the basic reactor physics. But what's really important for, for, the, for the engineer that says, well, how am I going to make use of this in terms of making power? And it sort of gets us back to the, to the first few slides that we started talking about. And, and the concept is, is reaction rate. Now, the reaction rate basically is, how are we going to make heat? And of course, generally reaction rates are macroscopic cross sections times the flux over the volume. Okay? So if you take a certain volume, you have a certain amount of material. Let's just take the fission, fission cross section as the issue. You, you, have, you take the flux, multiply by the cross section, average it integrate it over the whole volume, let's assume this has a certain sigma f and a certain flux distribution, you will get a certain amount of neutrons reacting in this space, whether solved by the Boltzmann equation or the diffusion equation or, or some Monte Carlo simulation. Now for us, what we want to know is what power, in this case thermal power, are we going to be able to create from this configuration of fuel and materials? And essentially, it's, it's, it's the reaction rate times the energy per reaction. So we have a term that we use called the energy per fission. And you recall that was about 200 MeV integrated over, and the only way you can make a fission is have material that's fiss uh, fissionable times the flux over the volume. So you're integrating it over the volume. And of course, this term, sigma f, is a function of the number density of uranium-235, or fissionable materials, times the uranium-235 cross-section. And if you want to make it a function of E, you can do it. This is what, what, what the purpose of this entire lecture was, is to understand that you have core power distribution that you can calculate using the fusion theory. But that core power distribution creates a flux. That flux, then depending upon how you configure your fuel, will be able to produce a certain amount of energy at 200 MeVs per fission, which you integrated over the whole volume, you can calculate the total thermal power that that core or configuration that you've created, assuming it's critical, can make. And the other factor that you need to worry about is the location of the absorbers and the leakage, such that you don't lose the neutrons, or you don't absorb too many of them in either the boron or the steel or the or other materials, and that you can appropriately slow down the neutrons by scattering them with an appropriate moderator, 
such that they're not lost or absorbed. And with that, we have completed the reactor physics review. And um, if you have any questions, please ask your instructor. And but this is this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the bottom line equation. And the determining factor is how is this flux calculated? And that's a function of geometry, material buckling, and all those combined together that says we can keep a reactor critical at one for 18 to 24 months. And what that will require is putting enough uranium in here and having enough depletable poison in here to manage the excess reactivity, but not too much so that the reactor doesn't shut down prematurely. So I'd be happy to answer your questions. Uh, hopefully you'll ask your instructor. Thank you. Now the homework is, is, is found in NEEP Chapter 4, and the problems are listed here above. And if you have any questions about the homework problems, again, uh, ask your instructor. But this should give you a good, solid review of, of, of some of the things that we talked about. In this course, we're not going to be able to, um, to run sophisticated computer codes, but at least you'll get an appreciation of what it is that's involved in doing a core reactor physics calculation.